Cislo Spice, digital recipes for dominance. Cislo Cislo Spice. Recipes for digital dominance. Hello everybody, we're gonna dive right in. All right, here's what's going on. So we got a little bit of Cislo Spice coming at you. We're gonna do free weekly trainings on everything relating to marketing, digital media, video production, video editing, website design, graphic design, social media design, how to generate more leads, growing a digital brand, brand transformation, brand strategy. They're all gonna be free live trainings that you're gonna get an accessible link to. We're gonna do it every Wednesday at 7 p.m. My goal is to really educate you, give you some spice, throw some heat on it, build it all together so that you have everything you need for free to check out and improve your brand, your marketing efforts on social media right now, especially right now with everything that's required to bring your brand, your business, whatever it may be, into the digital era. So I hope to see you there. Sign up, let's get you on. I look forward to seeing you there. Cislo Spice, recipes for digital dominance. I'll see you there. Hey everybody, how you doing? I'm just making sure this is good to go. Looks good. All right, hopefully you can hear me loud and clear. Welcome to another episode of Cislo Spice. We're on episode 11, which means we have 11 hours of content that you can go back and check out on the you and the tube. Today, we're going to be talking about something that is uh, really important, and it's about how brands create demand and what you can do uh, with your brand to really drive that attention that makes people say, oh, I want that. Like, I really need to have that. But also on the other side of it, you know, you setting up and creating a demand in a marketplace that didn't exist before. So we're going to dive into that today. For those of you that are new, uh, I'm Robert Cislo. I run Cislo Ventures. We're a creative advertising and marketing agency. I've uh, been doing it, oh man, 18 years now, creating content, creating ads, helping companies expand in the marketplace all the way across the board. So I'm going to share some of that insight with you tonight. Probably go, I mean, we'll try to go for an hour. We'll see what happens on that. Uh, we'll, we'll, I have a lot that I'd like to cover. There are all my points right there that uh, I would like to dive through. Uh, before we begin, um, all the replays are on my YouTube channel. So if you want to check those out, please make sure you're subscribed. If you haven't, please head over there and do that. There's a ton of content on there about advertising, marketing, branding, messaging, you know, web development, everything across the board that you need for the digital front. Um, and then also, if you yourself have a company or a business and you need some help in the marketing arena, uh, reach out to me. You can email me directly at robert at cislo.ventures.com. I'll put it in the chat and uh, we can actually build your ads for you, build the video content, manage your social media, build your funnels, websites. And if you want to go extreme, we could do a documentary about you as well. We have uh, ties with Paramount Pictures where we distribute the documentaries that we make over there to go on Amazon and Netflix. All right. So we'll dive into today and we'll just get started with this whole concept of uh, brands that created demand. It was actually inspired by um, someone had said something that I thought was really interesting and unique. And I said, oh man, that's an interesting topic. We should, we should really dive into this a little bit more. And that's what we're going to dive into tonight, right? So let's just start with the word demand. I thought it'd be interesting to define it and really get an you know, perspective on where it comes from. Because when you actually define it, it actually is not what you think it is. Like demand, you think, okay, demand, I want, I want. But really the, the, the definition of it is an insistent and preempt toward a preemptive request made as if by right. Like I'm making this request, like I'm creating this because I have a right to do so. And when you derive that thing down, it actually says from Latin, demand error, Sorry, I'm not good at Latin. Hand over in trust or in medieval Latin, it says formally to order, which is interesting. Formally to order. So why did I do that? Because when you think about demand, when you think about products, services, brands that you really like, brands that you know are household names that are out there and you're like, wow, I want to be a part of that. Like you're literally, it's creating this desire to have, right? You've got to have it. You want to be a part of it. You want to be connected to it in some way, shape, or form. It could be a product, it could be sunglasses, it could be purses, it could be cars, it could be whatever. But they create kind of this 
experience that, well, they want, they're creating a thing where you want to experience it is really what it is. It's an, it's an environment. You want to be a part of that. And so when I think about branding, you know, most people go down the path and they say, well, I'm going to build a really colorful thing and I'm going to have this cool font and I'm going to make this look really awesome and so on and so forth. I would say on the scale of importance for a brand, that's probably really low. I mean, I mean, it's somewhat like if you're building like a restaurant, it has a theme, it has an environment, that'd be pretty different. That would have a, a thing. But really what's the overall arching thing for me with a brand is that is that experience, right? Like, why do I want to be associated with this? What does this what does this actually mean for me? Why would I want to invest thousands of dollars or anything into a brand? Right. But that's because of the demand that they're, they're building this in you. And the guys that do this really effectively that I've seen throughout the years, which we'll dive into, I mean, there is that want like, oh, I have to have a connection to this. Right. But most people, when they build their company or they run their business or they run their ads, they kind of miss this part. They miss that experience. Like, what am I going to get when I go to a company? right? They get focused on, I want the leads, which is important. I'm not knocking it. Like you should be focused on that. It is something that's truly impactful and something that you should have, but they miss that development of the experience that would make somebody want to keep returning. Like there's a certain way that somebody communicates. There's a certain feeling that you get certain energy that comes out of that brand that says, oh, I want to come back to that. And then you look at all the products that are connected to it and you say, oh, I want to support that brand and I want to, I want to be connected to it in some, some, somehow, some way. I don't know how, but I want to do it, right? And then there's the part of it that's a little bit unobtainable, which is kind of an interesting thing when you think about it. Brands that can create pieces of themselves that are almost unobtainable creates that desire and that reach even more, which will lead to more leads down the road. But what am I talking about by that unobtainable thing? Think about... I'll just give you an example. I'm going to ask, I haven't asked Martin. I love Aston Martin, but there's a car out there. It's it, they, they just released it. It's two and a half million dollars. And I would love to have this car, but I know that I'm not quite there yet <laughs> to be able to buy this car, but because of the brand and the, what it represents to me, what they've created as far as that kind of like elegant, high class showy, but not too showy, a little bit more refined, you look at it and you say, oh, God, I wish I could have it. And that, that, that out of reach, that out of reach desire, okay, that, that can't quite be met is really something you have to look at as a business owner or as an individual that's building out a company or as someone that's building out a brand. Like, how do I create a product that is almost practically unobtainable? It can be reached but it can't quite be reached by the masses. Then how do I scale products back from that high level to be able to get people to want to buy just to be a part of that brand? Like an example of that would be when you go buy a car and they have like the ultra limited edition and then they have the edition right below that. And then they have that kind of middle of the road edition. And then they have that entry level edition. You know, most people want to get that limited edition, but you start checking out the prices and you're like, wow, that's like a $30,000, $40,000 price increase. So you kind of settle for the middle. See, but that's where they get you. They show you this high end, really almost ultra luxurious thing. And you're like, yeah, well, but I want to get the middle of the road. So you as a brand, when you're, when you're looking at your customer base and you're looking at all the products and services that you have, you got to have that kind of dynamic range in there of, of offerings right? So creating demand comes from actually setting up two things. The first is that ultra high end price point. Okay. That price point from a viewpoint of an audience member or a potential customer helps to define and assert your value in the marketplace. Okay. Like if I look at a product and that product is like, wow, that's, that's quite, that's 10 grand. Okay. All right. Well, what, what am I actually going to get with that? versus other individuals. Like some of the pricing that I've done in the past, I've had people say, that's a little bit more than I expected. And I'm like, well, when you walk into a Ferrari dealership, do you walk in and you say, well, that's a little bit more than what I expected. Could you probably lower that? And they're going to be like, you can leave now. 
right? You have to kind of have that attitude with your business and your pricing and your brand. You act like the boss, like you own it. You're creating the demand by right. We go back to the uh, definition made as if by right. It's your right to create that demand, that, that situation where it's like, I'm setting the rules of this joint because it's my, it's my baby. I built it. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into it. I know what the value of my products and services are. Therefore, I can dictate that in the marketplace. Okay. The second, the second piece of that is that experience that comes with it. Like, what are you going to get with it? Right. So my company, we're a service-based business, right? So we're hundred percent service-based. You can't touch anything that we create. Um, it's all digital air is basically what it is. But the experience that you get from that is totally something different. Like number one, the amount of communication that is delivered, like when someone comes into the ecosystem or comes down on as a client is, is it's overwhelming. So much so that we've had people be like, this is too much, but I want that experience. I want you to feel like, do you need anything? Do you need, I'd rather have you tell me, dude, don't call me again. I don't need you to call me every, every other day. Good. Okay, fine. I won't. But you know, to the lengths of which that we go. The second thing that I do with, with, is, is we have this really speedy response time. So if someone sends a message or someone says a request or someone has a problem or situation, it's almost immediate if you're not sending it at one o'clock in the morning. Any other time prior to around 11, you know, 12 o'clock to about 6 a.m. in between that window, you get an immediate response. But that's the, that's the demand that I've created. Okay, I set the standard for advertising agencies to try to come up and touch, right? Because I know that they won't because it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of energy and it takes a lot of effort, right? But I'm doing that as my right because it's my brand. I'm setting the rules. I have my pricing. I have that values. I've created an experience. So when you look at your company and you think about, okay, what kind of price product, what kind of price range do we have? Do we have enough price range? Do we have a ultra high-end luxury price range that I could come back to? Your version of a luxury price range. I'm not saying like it has to be perfectly at that level, but thinking about it from that perspective and that viewpoint of, do we have a high-end piece that we're not marketing? And then do we have an entry level? Like, can people get in here? Because when I look at a brand, I look at a few things. I'm looking at, okay, what's the vibe? What are they saying? What are they representing? What are their prices? And then that kind of gives me an indication of where they want to go, right? So you're creating this demand that exists out there in an industry. So how do you, how do you actually do that? So let's look at the reasons for creating demand. Like where does, this, where does this actually come from? And I have this broken down into a few things. Number one is needs. Like what's needed right now or is needed but doesn't exist. Number two, wants. What's out there that like, what are you wanting? What are a lot of people wanting? Are people wanting a better car buying experience? Are people wanting a better clothing buying experience? Are people wanting a better experience on their digital storefront? Like what's the want? And then the disease are all different. Like the desire, that desire is a deep burning, yearning to feel, experience and have. Like where are those desires in your industry? Okay. That are lacking. It's something that everybody would talk about, right? I'll give you an example. The, tr the, the city of where I live has gotten so overpopulated in Florida that it's just almost, it's, it's turned into Los Angeles almost, which is not a good compliment, right? It's really hard to just go two miles because it takes so damn long with the traffic. Like, I just want to go to the bank. It's a mile and a half away, 40 minutes. How does that even logically make sense, right? What's the experience of the city? Okay, yes, it's beautiful. I live on the ocean. We have this great apartment. But man, that experience out there is just not something that I want to be a part of. So I'm thinking to myself, man, if I ran this city, I'd be really focused on that. Great that we have all this influx of people moving, but did we accommodate the infrastructure for it? Because we're going to quickly create a problem. See, that's the other side of the brand, right? You could fill that need, want, desire, but you could create a problem because there's too much traffic. Then it becomes too muddled. So you have to figure out and ask yourself, all right, well, how do I keep that exclusive? And how you keep that exclusive at those price points, right? That ultra luxury, high end deal, man. You keep them in that level to keep them reaching, right? And that's where you want to play. Another reason, problem solving. I talk about that a lot, pretty self-explanatory. Broken systems is a big one, especially in the service-based industry uh, with your business. I don't know what business it is. Maybe it's real estate. Uh, maybe it's uh, e-commerce. Uh, maybe it's fashion. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's it, it's 
you know, a dealership? What is it, right? Broken systems. What is that experience like, okay? If somebody could figure out how to like make calling a bank or credit card faster and more efficient, they would be billionaires. Like that's an industry right there. You could create a demand out of that, right? Imagine solving that problem. So you got to go to where that excruciating problem is for a lot of people. Man, if this could only be better, I could solve this with my solution. Frustration is another big one. Seeking something new. This is what I'm looking for. Okay. I want to know all these things and I want to hear these things because I could do something about that. Okay. If somebody's cranky and dropping their frustrations out and really saying what they have issues with and, and what, what's, be, you know, those are the things I want to know because I, as a brand can then just inject myself and talk about that and create the products that solve those problems. Right. See, a brand is not just it's not done by a marketing team. It's done by an individual. It's done by the services you provide overall. Right. So you're looking for the needs, the wants, the desires, the problem solving, the broken systems, the frustrations, the seeking something new, all of those different things, because that's where you have the opportunity to just inject yourself with the, you know, the pent ultimate solution made by right by you. See, I used to think, I used to look at all these other big guys out there and their brands and what they were doing and what they were saying and all the power that they had. And I said, you know, I don't feel like I have the right to say anything because these guys already have a space. But the truth is, is that that's, that couldn't be any further from the actual truth of the situation because I'll let you in on a little secret. They just say whatever they want, right? They just say it. They don't have any back off on that, on that. I got to say this now. I have to communicate this now. There's no back off on that. And that's the only difference between a brand that can create a demand and solve that demand versus a brand that's struggling to make any type of presence at all. It's just that they, by right, go out and just communicate. And they just say whatever they want to say. Now, am I saying you need to be an a-hole? You need to be a douchebag? No, you don't. What I'm saying is, is that you need to look at it from the perspective of, I need to at least minimally say something about this. Because nobody else is. Or if they are, they could be saying it wrong. Based on the needs, wants, desire, problems, on drugs, and frustration, seeking something new. Based on all those different viewpoints. Second thing, reasons for demand. Somebody wants to move closer to an ideal situation that they're trying to achieve, but they can't quite achieve it yet. They want to experience something that's better than where they are now, but they can't quite get there. And that goes back to that unobtainable viewpoint. How do I position something that's just a little bit outside that reach, but people will reach for it no matter what. They will sell their dogs, their liver, their kidney for that Louis Vuitton bag, right? Why don't they do that for your business? Like they have to think I need this, right? But you set the precedence for that. And that's something that took me a little bit to understand from the advertising perspective, because everybody wants to be in advertising. And there's so many options, you know, and I talk about this a lot. Everybody got, everybody complains about the advertising space. I'm like, well, I hate this space. Yeah, it's a really tough space. But when you're the guy out there, you know, on the front lines, making the calls, following up, making that content, communicating over and over and over again about it, I've just created my own demand by doing it, right? Because I'm trying to get people to move over to a better scene. You know, doing these episodes is just an attempt for me to try to move you that are watching to a better situation, to a better scene, because otherwise you're just going to flounder around, right? And so that's the purpose of this. I want to increase prosperity. That's another reason for demand, right? Either increased actual prosperity or increased perceived prosperity. Now, the, the first is like physical, like you actually see, you know, a monetary increase, a monetary value increase, the bank account goes up, everything gets a little bit better. And then there's the perceived monetary prosperity increase, the perceived, like they are being seen as perceiving to be better, right? So where you get those guys that pose in front of the Lambos and all that stuff, which I mean, it's fine. It is what it is. But you could play into that a little bit and, and look at it from the standpoint of how could I incorporate that perceived desire to be connected to me, what that means for you, Right. Well, how do I play into that? What is it about my company? What is it about that I do every day 
that we, how do we communicate to new clients? How do we solve problems for new clients that give that perceived like, wow, I'm, you're connected with who, who's doing your marketing, who's helping you with your vehicle, but like, how do you increase that perceived value? Which is something I've never heard anybody actually talk about, but it's something that totally exists. Brand association is really the fancy term for it. But really what that is, is a perceived proximity of prosperity, that perceived value of prosperity, right? Now, I'm not saying to lie and to do it just for that reason, but I am saying you could use that to an advantage, especially if you know how to position yourself in the marketplace a little bit more effectively over the other guys that are there, right? Well, you have this other company that does X, but this is why we do Y. You know, I'll never forget one of the biggest lessons I learned in advertising really early on. Um, we were, what were we doing? We were talking about, I think it was something financial. And I had a friend of mine send me a video and she said, watch this video. And I was like, okay, what is it? She's like, this is, this is how they make, this is how Louis Vuitton actually makes their purses. Right. And I said, okay, all right, all right, I'll watch it. You know, what am I going to? So I'm watching the video and I'm going through it and, and you know, they're showing each, each intricate stitch, each little flap, the selection of the materials, where those materials come from, where it's made, how it's made, the assembly, like all these little fine details. And then at the end, they show you the final product and they use this as an ad. And I said, wow, that's really interesting. Like, how could you take that kind of luxury viewpoint of all those little intricate details that created demand for women all across the world to want to spend five grand that they didn't have to buy this or they did have it and, and, and actually buy this thing because it's all perceived prosperity, perceived value, right? So when you look at your brand in the marketplace, are you actually giving that perceived value, that perceived quality? Because that increases your position, which allows you to dictate the demand of why people would want to work for you. Like this is the crux of it right here that I'm saying. Perception. Perception of how someone would be viewing you and also the perception of an individual themselves for working with you. Like these people should feel blessed that they're even able to be connected to you. Right? They should feel like, wow, I'm really honored that this person wants to work with me. Now, I'm not saying that to be rude. I'm not saying that to be douchey. I'm just saying it from the standpoint of that is perceived connection. That's loyalty. And then that creates more demand. Oh, dude, I'm working with Robert. Or, oh, dude, I'm working with John. I'm working with Frank and their company. And they're like, oh, what is that? Oh, yeah, these guys. Oh, wow, I want to, I'm interested. How do I get connected to that? Right? How do I, how do I create? How do I, how do I get involved? Right? I'm creating that demand. That's what I'm looking for. I want to sip on my coffee. How do I, how do I get that perceived experience? You know what I mean? So I'll tell you a story. We'll go into cars for a second for myself. And um, first of all, I was really afraid to promote my car because I didn't want to be perceived as a douchebag. And I really don't use it that much, but you know, I was, I was a little worried about it, but I'll tell you how I selected it, why I selected it and what happened. Brand perceived value because it's perfect, right? So Aston Martin, James Bond, 007, sleek, sophisticated, sexy, cool, clean, minimalist lines, right? Lamborghini, like when I look at a Lambo, and I'm just giving you my perception of how I think of things. Do I look at a Lamborghini and say, I have to have that car? I can appreciate a Lamborghini for what it is, but I don't want the car. I'll tell you why. I think they're douchey. I think they're really douchey. I think they're too much. They're too over the top. It's too like, <gasps> look at me, look at me. Now, if you own a Lambo, great. Good for you. Not my cup of tea, right? Ferrari. I love Ferrari. I love Ferrari for the longest time. I was like, I want a Ferrari so bad. And then I was like, but everybody has one. Like, there's nothing really unique about it. You know, I live in Miami where I see a Ferrari, McLaren, Lamborghini almost every other day. Aston Martin, not so much. And I was like, hmm, boutique, a little more private, a little more exclusive. Okay, I'm going to be a little more, I want to, I like exclusive experiences. Okay, I like being treated like I'm a million bucks. I like that, hey, you're, you know, we want to take care of you. So that's why I picked Aston Martin, right? I picked that one because I liked it. Two, nobody has one. Three, it's a little bit more exclusive, right? And so that's, that's, that's how I approach my company. I'm like, wow. 
you know, how do I create that, that exclusive experience? I took the Aston in to get a quick uh, brake upgrade. You know what these guys did? I've never seen this done before. At the end of the repair, I don't know how many actual dealerships actually do this, but at the end of the repair, what they did is they, they took a, a cell phone video of everything they did. They showed me the car, blah, 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 showed me every little piece, blah, blah, blah. intricacies, perceived value, perceived prosperity, perceived association. I took the time to go film every under the hood, up underneath the thing. I don't even know what he's talking about. He's like, see, this looks good. I'm like, yeah, it looks good. And he shoved it inside. He's like, see that bolt? That bolt looks great. I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, but it feels great. Perceived association, perceived value. So I was like, oh man, how could we inject that into our company a little bit more? What could we do that's different, right? Perceived value, perceived association, increased prosperity, moving closer to a better situation, moving closer to a better lifestyle. Okay. How does your product and service, I don't care if you're doing plumbing. Okay. How could you as a plumbing company have that increased prosperity perceived deal? Uh, well, tell me about the products that you're using. Maybe they're awesome. Maybe you can't get them. Maybe there's something really exclusive about it that nobody else has that gets me interested in that. That's creating demand. It's just going to create more demand for other people. Dude, you got to use this plumber. Demand. Dude, you got to use this. Oh, demand. Right? So what are you doing in your company to do that? You're taking a look at the needs. You're taking a look at the wants. You're taking a look at the desires. You're taking a look at how you solve problems. You're taking a look at the broken systems, the frustrations, the seeking something new. And then you're looking at it from the increased prosperity, the increased perception of prosperity, the increased perception of being associated, moving closer to an ideal situation and a better lifestyle. Third part of that is be, when you actually do all that correctly, what your brand should be doing is making things a lot more simpler for people to live, making things a lot more accessible and easier to be accessed. So all this social media content that you're putting out there should reflect everything that we're talking about because you're, you're setting up the demand, you're setting the status, you're setting the bar in the marketplace for what you do. Okay, because nobody else will do it at that level, right? That over communication, the, the everything, every action sets the bar in the marketplace for the brand that makes that demand happen. Okay, you're removing problems out of it. You're removing situations. You know what I would do? If I, I would somehow figure out how to just make an express high rise lane that would just go above the road that we have and it would just go over and you only get off where you need to get off. I love that idea, right? right? They just keep building more skyscrapers here, but they're not thinking about the infrastructure. You're running your advertisements, but you're not thinking about the foundation. You're trying to get leads. You're trying to get product sales, but you don't have the infrastructure to support that. You don't have the ecosystem. You don't have the experience. You don't have the, the perception. You're just batting into a room, a crowded room where everybody's standing shoulder to shoulder trying to do the same thing, but nobody is distinguishing themselves because they're all running the same type of ads, right? They're not creating that perceived experience that, that they're not building that. It's not there. What happens? The reputation, you get, no, you get no reputation. You create no demand. Nobody wants to buy. And then you say advertising is a POS. Advertising sucks. Robert, advertising sucks. Good. Did you do anything about what I'm talking about here? Well, no, we, we really focused on the targeting and we really focused on the optimizing of the budget and we did all this thing. Okay, good. But did we actually go here? Did we actually create and remove and simplify and increase freedom and show that somebody could move to a better position in their life? No. Okay. What, were, what was your purpose of that? Well, we wanted leads. Wrong purpose. Wrong purpose. Low cost per acquisition. Low cost per click. Low cost per lead. If it costs me $100 to get one lead and the lead paid me $6,000, I don't care. Shit. I mean, if the lead costs $100 and they paid me a $500, I'd be happy. Even if the lead costs $100 and I got paid $80, I'd be like, all right, we're getting there. There's action because I could create demand. Wrong intention, though. Like, that's the point. It's the wrong intention, right? Yes. Are those numbers important? For sure. Are they the primary thing? No, I don't. I don't look at any of that. I just want the perceived experience, 
right? I want that. What does Robert Sislo stand for? What does Sislo Ventures stand for? What does your company stand for, right? What kind of, what am I going to perceive from you? What am I going to perceive to be connected to you? Like, what is that experience for me? Have you defined what that experience is, right? Have you created almost a luxury item that is a must have, must want? I need this. I need this. I'll pay for it. Oh, PVC pipes versus the higher end pipe, carbon fiber pipe, put it in. Last 50 years, good, do it. It's more expensive, no problem, right? What is that? Perceived value, perceived experience, right? You know what I mean? And I remember back when I was making, you know, I was making like 45 grand a year and I wanted to go fly and I wanted to fly first class. And then I wanted to, you know, but I couldn't afford it. And then, you know, with the company now, I fly first class. And sometimes I complain about the experience because it's not that good. It's like, look, you're charging me for this, but my experience is terrible, right? First on the plane, first off the plane, wait an hour for your luggage. How does that even logically make sense to be charged anything more? That doesn't make sense, right? See, perceived value, perceived experience, but people will still, pay. I'll still pay for it. Perceived value, perceived prosperity makes a difference right? Plus that's where all the people are that I want to talk to you, right? That's how we want to break it down. So now that we're through that first half of that piece, like the reasons, like where does that demand coalesce from? Where does it, you know, where does it, where does it begin? Let's look at your role, like your role, your brand's role in creating that demand, okay? If you guys have questions, you can put it in chat um, or if you have comments, put it in comments, whatever you want to do, I'm more than happy to answer them. So we're looking at what is the brand's role, okay? It is the icon. The brand is the icon. It's the top. It's the pinnacle. It's the thing. It's what it is. It's the representation. It's the highest of the highest. In your mind, in your company, in your business, that's how you have to look at it. Am I the highest of the highest? Am I, the, am I trying to be the icon? Now, I'm not saying that from a vanity standpoint, some people do. <laughs> Some people are very vain and obnoxious and over the top. But all I'm saying is, do you have the mentality and does the presence of what you say and how you say it, does it really exude that icon? Are you building to be an icon? Like, what are you building for? Right? Are you building for an icon? Or are you building for leads? Don't build for leads, build for being an icon. That's where your leads will come in from the representation of the best, the best service, the best quality, the best customer experience, icon. That's your role. Your role is to create the icon presence, right? The highest echelon of what makes something unique and variable. I love that word echelon. I think that's one of my favorite words. Echelon, meaning the upper portion of society or group, you know, the highest part of a group. You set that. I mean, if you really think about it, Think about any brand out there today that created that presence where we're like, we have to be a part of it. What separates a Louis Vuitton bag from a coach bag? What separates a Ferrari from a Honda? What separates a Mercedes from a BMW? Hmm? What, what is it? Right? What's the breakdown? What separates a Rolls Royce from a Range Rover? What is that? What is the highest echelon of what makes something unique and viable? All these companies started at ground zero and were not known. They didn't have the, they didn't have the connection um, that they have today or the power that they had today. They just had one simple ideology. We want to make luxurious vehicles that are for the higher class to be enjoyed, Right. Are you doing that? Did you ever do that in your company? Did you ever think, oh, I built this business to be the highest quality of service, to be the highest echelon of where I want it to be, and to represent that with the ideals and the content and the stuff that I put out in the marketplace? Like, did I think about that? What, are you, what is that position that I was trying to take there? Uh, most people don't think that way because they're, 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 you get distracted by the big boys, because they think that they hold all the power. But again, that's, that's perceived power. 
designed to do one thing. They create the demand in the marketplace. Perception. They created that perceived experience. So you're like, why do I need to go? But they started at ground zero, right? So you yourself just walk into the room and just be like, I am creating the perceived power here. We are exclusive. We are tailor-made. We are boutique. We are connected to you. This is why we are the echelon. We're not trying to create the echelon. We are the echelon of that brand, right? Difference with Rolls Royce, Range Rover. What's the difference? Ferrari, Honda. What's the difference? Honda's not going after that market. They could. They have some models that they have. And they, there's other brands like Nissan has Lexus, which is their, I think it's Nissan. Don't quote me if I'm wrong on that. You know, Lexus is their, you know, it's their higher end brand, right? They wanted to touch that market, right? How are you doing that with your brand to create the demand in the marketplace? No matter the business, landscaping, plumbing, e-commerce, Amazon drop shipping. Like how can you create that, imp that, that perceived prosperity, the perception that I need to be associated with it, right? And if you look at that, it looks, it's quality. And so what I said about the video of the Louis Vuitton purse being created, it was all perception. Every other purse maker on earth does the same exact thing, but none of them promote it the way that these guys promote it. They built that name because they created that perception, that increased prosperity, perceived prosperity that people, oh, I need to buy that. Let me, here's my leg. Take my leg, man. I want to buy the Yves Saint Laurent purse. Take my leg. I'll buy the Ferrari. We'll get a second mortgage on the house so I could buy the Ferrari that I always wanted, right? How do you do that? with your company. That's what we're talking about right now. You be the icon. You already set the bar. You set the highest echelon and you use all those other things that we discussed the first 30 minutes of this episode, right? If the brand has it though, so if you create it, if you create it and you put it out there as like, this is the best, this is what I love. I put my blood, my sweat, my tears, every phone call, Every Instagram story, every single thing, every follow-up, every email, every client handling creates that want, right? Some people would turn around and they would say, oh man, those people talk too much. They're bragging too much about themselves. That's not it. They're doing that increased perception of their brand to create a demand for it. You should be doing that. Like it's a value, it's a value thing right? Well, we send these emails and we do this and we deliver like this and we go fast and we did it and we break it down and we make sure they understand it and we keep it simple and we really get the results and we, you know, slave for hours. Now I'm not, that's not embellishment. Like it, it should be the truth. Like don't over embellish, but you, you want that projection because it's a perception play. All a brand is, is a perception play. That's it. That's really what a brand is, right? Why would you buy I mean, give me an example. Another example of that would be, you know, Adidas versus a no-name brand. Adidas has that look, the feel, Nike, you know, oh, just do it, you know, oh, I want to be a part of that. <clears throat> They're getting into the psyche. They're looking at, as I said, needs, wants, desires, problem solving, broken systems, frustration, seeking something new increased prosperity, perceived prosperity, moving closer to an ideal scene, a better lifestyle, removing problems, making things simpler, making things cooler, which I didn't have here, increased freedom, increased time, a luxury that must be have, that must be experienced, wanting to stand out and be seen because of the connection to you, right? That's what we want to look at. The feeling of connection and representation that you truly stand for something. I already said that, Aston Martin versus Ferrari. Why I went Aston Martin? and not a Ferrari, right? Why did I do that? Well, I did it because I wanted to be unique. I wanted to stand out. I wanted to be a little bit different. I want people to look at it. I love driving that car because kids, families, women, men, grandparents, old people, when that thing runs down the road, they're like, they smile. They smile. And I'm like, oh my God, it's a public service. This is a public service. I'm making people happier. I'm sharing that. It's my brand. You know, we want people to smile. We want people to have a better experience, right? The feeling and the connection and the representation that you stand for something like, what is that for you? I don't care what business you have, but what is it? Perceived perception, perception, perception. 
The communications of the above issues, which is all the things that I listed out above and the solutions that you provide for it, right? So yes, you may have the best product, you may have the best solution, but your brand doesn't communicate it enough or you don't repeat the message enough. Most people don't repeat their messages enough, right? People like, Rob, like, like oh, I created this content. I don't want to use it again. I'll re, I reuse so much content because I know people didn't get it the first time. It takes a lot of communication for that to happen, for that, for that communication to penetrate, but that's my brand. That's the ecosystem. That's the life. I'm creating that. Oh, wow. Robert keeps showing up. Robert keeps showing up. Robert keeps showing up. You know, I had, I've done, I've been doing about hundred to about 150 to 200 calls a day, every day for the last two weeks. And I'm calling people from when I first started my company three years ago. And people are like, your follow-up game's insane. That's my brand. I, I, I follow up, you know, I was trained to follow up. Like, do you have people saying those things about you? Like, where is that experience for yourself? Like, are you building that? Oh, damn, dude, your follow-up game's insane. You just don't let up. No, I don't. No, I don't. Because today could be the day that we do business. It wasn't ready a year ago. You weren't ready two years ago. You weren't ready three years ago. But today you could be ready. There's a business I've been calling. I did $10 billion in sales. I've been trying to close this deal for five years. And I'll still go. May never close. May never happen. But I will continue to call because one day might be the day. And I've had it happen. I've had it happen. Where they finally said, I'm ready right? The creation of an item or service that is highly desirable. How do you create an item or service via a brand that is highly desirable? Okay. Communication of the people that use it currently, getting them to talk about it, probably priority number one. But number two, like, again, you control that, right? Let's go back to the definition. An insistent, you know what insistent means? And pre preemptory Request made as if by right. That's the definition of demand. An insistent and preemptory request made as if by right to hand over and trust formally to order, right? Who's responsible for that? You are, right? I went back to you and I said, look, these other companies, they didn't have, you know, they didn't have the reputation when they started. They created that reputation through that consistent, like, bashing of the marketplace on, hey, buy this and you'll be better. Hey, get this and your perception of how people see you increases. It's magical, right? It's all perception. Branding is all perception, right? It doesn't matter about the amount of money you have to spend on your advertising. It doesn't matter the cost per lead. It doesn't matter the cost per acquisition. What matters is the perception. That's it. And that sounds a little bit vain when you think about it, but you have control over that perception. And you should have control over that perception. You set the perception. You set the communication. You set what's being said about you, right? You're set about that. You can't waver and go back and forth and complain about it, you know. But there's yet here's a fine line though. See, where does it get into the into the realm of perfection before getting it out? Where does that happen? You know, that that's something where we could just talk about for a whole hour, but you know focusing on the standard setting and the demand setting and the brand and the, and the presence and it has to be perfect versus getting as close as you can to getting it out in the marketplace. Who do you think is going to achieve it faster? Well, we know the answer to, you should know the answer to that question, but I just don't want you to get too caught up in that, you know, making it perfect thing. Like, and I, and I want to inject that a little bit here. I want you to try to figure out how to do it how to do it effectively, how to break it down effectively without falling into the realm of perceived. Like how could you create that perceived wealth, that perceived association without being too perfect? You'll get to perfection. It will happen. It'll happen. But at the beginning or whether you are where you are right now and you're trying to pivot and you're like, okay, what are we going to do that's different? How are we going to position this better in the marketplace today that we haven't done before? Don't get caught up in the perfection thing on that. And I just wanted to inject that caveat there because it could cause a lot of situations and a lot of issues, right? Our objective though, is to get somebody to an ideal situation. Our objective is to make them want us to get them to buy from us so that, because they believe that we can help them. And that is 100% done through branding, marketing, 
awareness campaigns, all that stuff. But it's also 100% done through what you say and how you say it. <clears throat> it's a lot to think about. I don't want to overwhelm you, but it's your right to do so. It's your right to build it. Right? I mean, some people I've, you know, there's a thing also you need to think about and not fall into is saying something to just be antagonistic about it. Like, oh, well, I see all these other companies doing this flat rate, blah, blah, blah. I've seen a lot of this lately. And it's just like, well, I don't really know what you're trying to communicate there because you're doing the same thing, even though you're saying you're not doing the same thing. Like you got to watch where you're falling into certain communication patterns um, that are representative of your brand that you're actually promoting out there. Sorry if I'm blinking a lot. I got this LED light. It's got a thousand little LED bulbs on it and all I see are little blue dots. But that's what, that's what we're talking about here is don't fall into that. Oh, I'll create a demand by being antagonistic. No, 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 no. We're not, it's not, you don't have to go out there and be, you know, a major douche to get attention and to create the demand. That's not what we're trying to do here, right? Especially if it's luxurious, especially if you're trying to introduce a new product into the marketplace that didn't exist before. All we're really trying to do is to get, get a customer, potential customer or client to view us in a different light, to view us in an increased perception of wealth, of connection, right? And so when I'm thinking about the, every Instagram story that I do, when I think about every ad that I run, when I think about my website, I was talking to my buddy Doug about this. I said, look, my website, I mean, it's beautiful. It's great. It gets us leads, but it's not the primary thing, but it is a flag it's a flagpole to what we can do. It's, an, it's a window into the type of creation we have, like the creation of the creative ability that we have. It's like a smorgasbord of everything we can do, the greatest hits, right? That's what the web, sysloventures.com, that's what, that's what it's for, okay? Does it sell? Yes. Do people buy? Yes. Do people register? Yep. Does it educate? Absolutely. Probably educates too much. Um, probably doesn't have enough mystery, but it's a flagship. It's a representation of an iconic brand, which is me. And when I say that, I'm not saying it as a vanity point. Oh, my brand is an icon for marketing. That's how I view it, but I'm not saying it to be derogatory I'm not saying it to be rude. I'm saying it because that's what I really believe and because I can create that perceived value in the marketplace and acquire more leads and business because of that reason, because the attitude that I have is there, right? That's where I'm coming from with it. It's, it's, it's like, okay, what's the desire to look good on social media? Check. Okay. What's, what else? What else? What's a broken system? Uh, people that sign up for advertising companies and they never get a uh, report, you know, they get a quarterly report or they get a monthly report. I'm like, okay, I'll send reports every week. Okay. What else? Uh, frustration. Okay. Uh, lack of results, uh, lack of communication on what's going on. Uh, no communication at all. Uh, nothing getting fixed. Okay, good. Um, I'll fix that. I will do weekly reports. We'll do weekly calls. We'll do weekly instant emails practically. And I will promote like crazy online so that people have access to resources. Okay, good. Check. Seeking something new. Okay, what's new? Okay, the way that we produce content, the style of that content, uh, the graphics, the building out, it's new. Okay, good. Let's promote that. See, so I'm walking down. What I'm telling you is what I'm doing, right? Everything about this is what I'm doing. And I hope to achieve you know, a high level icon status with this company. I, I, I do hope in 20 years, 30 years, it gets to, it gets to the number that I'm striving for. But I also want you guys to get there as well, because everything that I'm telling you is everything that I do. Uh, it's everything that I think about. It's how I approach my company. It's how I approach my business and, and the breakdown of that. So hopefully this is help, helpful. I hope you're learning something tonight. I mean, if, if anything that you get out of the last 50 minutes that we've been talking or so is that, that uh, perceived sense of prosperity and that perceived perception of association. Like if you really wanted to know how to create demand, it's those two things more than anything else. You have to create for the other person a perceived increase in wealth and prosperity and an actual increase in wealth and prosperity, but also an increased perception of association. 
right? That, oh my God, I'm connected to this person. I'm actually honored to be connected to that. Yeah, Daniel just said Apple does that with their clients. They do. They're great. I used to work for Apple. And genius. Like, I'll tell you a story. When I, when I signed up uh, to work for Apple, I was hired as a specialist. The guys that were on the floor that sell. And that training program that we went through, I mean, I'm, I'm telling you, everything that they say about what they do is it's all about the customer. The salespeople get no commission. They don't get any commission, um, but but it's all about the thing that they said was you always have to have an answer. But if you don't know an answer, you can literally just tell them I don't know. Let's find out together. And I thought that was really cool. I was like, wow, what an what an open and transparent way uh, to try to handle things. And then I scaled up and I became a creative. So I taught everybody and I did workshops and stuff. And then I was a genius for a little while where I repaired computers and all that stuff. But dude, Apple, I mean. They're, they're kind of sluggish now, like they're not as good as they were, but back in 2013, 12, 2012, when I worked for them, they really had their stuff together. I don't know about right now, um, but I think on some level they do, the business side of things they do. So what am I doing um, to really create that demand and where do I get the information to actually uh, build that brand in the marketplace uh, that, that creates demand, right? So we really talked about the reasons for it. We cleared that definition up, you know, uh, that insistent, 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 like I'm insisting uh, that everything I have to say is important because I believe it's important. It's my right. It's, it's, it's my ability to communicate that I need to have, that I need to keep consistent with, but also insist that I can influence your perception of me, but also influence the perce perception of where you are, or where you could be, right? A lot of motivational speakers are good at this. <laughs> Talk about perceived impressions, right? You go to that big event, you come home and you're like, well, it was great for four days, but damn, what do I do now? <laughs> anyway, sorry, not to knock motivation, but it is what it is. What am I doing? I'm studying trends of a space. You know, one quick, quick, motivational speakers. If you're a motivational speaker, follow up with these people over time and really make sure that they carry that win from that experience with you. Like if you really want to do it, right? You really want to do it right. Carry that win, follow up, follow up, follow up. Huge. Study. I study the trends of a space and I act, actively seek out from people. Like I'll randomly ask people, what do you want? What do you need? What do you desire? What problems are you having? What's broken? Yeah. What, what, do you, what do you perceive is broken about a system? And what do you perceive could be the solution for that? What are you most frustrated about? Like I'm asking people these questions. Whether somebody buys from me on the phone or if you get a call from me, I will ask you these questions just to find out right? I need to know this because I have nowhere to run with my brand. I may have product services, you know, the infrastructure's there, everything's ready to go, but I don't have that, that, um, <clears throat> the breath that I could use to actually build on. And I want to know. Now, when I say study trends of a space, I'm not saying, you know, study it for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. I'm saying just while you work, while you move through the world, be observant. You know what I mean? Like we were flying, we were flying back from New York last month and I was literally just like, was it New York? No, 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 no. I was flying back from a client shoot and the airline was really pushing everybody to leave early. Like I've never actually heard airline attendants and the captain be this pushy, but they're rushing everybody and they're like, we want to take off. And I'm like, okay. And they have everybody board slowly, number one. This is, this is a great story. Talk about problem, customer service, and how a brand could solve this problem. If there's a better airline than American Airlines, let me know. I'll jump on it. Anyway, so what ended up happening was they're complaining. The crew is complaining to us that they want to leave, but we're trying to load, and the flight is full, and they oversold the flight. That's problem number one. Problem number two is the flight was late. The flight was late. It was 30 minutes late. And now they're like, we have to take off. I'm like, you were late. You were late. Keeps getting better, right? <clears throat> so then we're going, we're going, we're ready to go. And they're not backing up from the gate. So they shut the doors, they're ready to go. And now there's too much, there's, there's planes literally behind us and they can't back out. Blaming us still. We take off and we land. And then they say something to the effect of, we need you to wait because we're late, because you didn't board, like this, it's all blame. It's all blame. 
So I immediately thought, I was like, wow, do any of the executives actually ever fly in their planes? <clears throat> do they ever actually, are they a customer of their own business? Because I guarantee you if they were, they'd shoot everybody that was like involved with that. But again, I'm looking for that for an experiential view. Would I ever blame a customer for anything? No, unless they're acting crazy. But otherwise, there's no reason. If there's a delay, we would take responsibility for the delay, right? So observe. I'm an active observer. And honestly, creating demand and advertising in my business and everything that's going on with that, like it literally comes from what I see everybody else doing wrong. Post office is a great example of that, right? Banks, right? Uh, credit card companies. Um, what else? Uh, return lines, malls, retail, you know, car buying experience. What could you assimilate that a lot of people have issues with, but then learn from and then improve upon that in your business? Like that's in your business. That's what I'm looking for. I want to know what that is. Right. I want to I want to really take control of that so that it doesn't happen in my ecosystem. And then I create that solution out there in the marketplace with my promotion. I'm also I just act like I'm already the best. You know, I act like I'm an icon. I act like that. I don't act like that as from a douche standpoint. But in my mind, like I'm like, OK, I'm already there. Everything's just got to catch up. I'm already there. The brand is already there. <clears throat> the business is already there. Everything else around me just needs to catch up to where I am. And as long as I do everything that I'm talking about right now as made by my right to do so, to order, I will achieve what I'm looking for. And, I, and that's basically how I've done everything, right? And then obviously create the presence online, but that's like, you could create the presence, but you have to incorporate all the things that I'm talking about now. Needs, wants, desires, broken system analysis, frustration, seeking something new, how can I increase prosperity? Man, I really, <clears throat> I've never seen anybody talk about a brand like this, but I really do hope that you take what I'm saying and really figure out a way to apply it to your business because this is the, this is the setting factor. Okay, if you look at a luxury brand, Cartier, you know, Harry Winston, whatever, they've created this almost unobtainable thing but we want to be associated to it. Like we will buy, we will put things on credit to have. We will do financing to get that ring, you know, because we want the association. We want to say, yeah, yeah, we did it. We did that, right? How are you applying that to your business with your own brand out there in the marketplace is something that you need to think about, okay? How are you removing problems? How are you moving people to an ideal situation? Making things simpler for them. God, if there's a way to make things simpler, faster, I'd be so happy. I hate waiting. Waiting is like the worst thing for me. I really despise it. I do everything quick. Like if I got to pay something, I pay it. If I got to send something, I send it. Da, da, da. Like nothing gets stalled because I don't want to wait. Like literally I walk around and I just say, how are you okay with this? Like how are people okay with waiting? You know? Anyway, that's a little off topic, but study the trends of a space or an industry, actively seek out complaints or problems from other industries that you could learn from, that you could implement into your business as a solution that make people say, I need to be having that. I want to be connected to that. <clears throat> I want to talk more to that. I want to be involved in that. Like, what is it? Okay. Create that digital identity, invest in the camera, invest in the presence, invest in the photos, Invest in the website, invest in the flagship of your greatest hits. Your greatest hits should be everywhere. They should be everywhere. Everything you believe, everything that you approach, how you build something, why you build something, all of that. All of that should be there. Justin has a question. If a person was just starting with $100, what would you start off in building a multi-million dollar business or brand? What would you start off with? Sorry, what would you start off with? in building a multi-million dollar business or brand? Well, I would, without knowing what that is, like, um, I don't know, you'd have to tell me what, what it is, like, where is the brand? Like, what is it? But if I just had to guess and I had $100 to begin with, I would figure out a way to make sure that I could communicate on every social platform I could. That would be the first thing. I would start 
with investing into, I mean, you really can't do much with a hundred, but with a hundred, make sure you have something that you can record with. Really the big thing, get a phone somehow, get something that you can record with so you can get access to these platforms and start creating that perceived viewpoint, right? Perception is everything. Start building that perception now, right? Even if you don't have the multi-million dollar brand, start building the perception now, okay? Uh, back in 2009, 2009, 2008 is when I started with a company called, they weren't called Turn Here. No, they were called Turn Here. And uh, they hired local filmmakers to go out and make ads for like City Search, Yellow Pages, NBC Universal. I didn't know anything about branding. I didn't have a lot of money, but I wish that I would have promoted sooner. I wish that I would have started then, like the second that I made my first video, I would have really promoted more. I would have really communicated more. I would have just really handled that and built that portfolio because it would have resulted in a lot more business a lot faster than what it took, uh, took me to do. I, I didn't really start understanding that until I was about 20, uh, 24, 2008. I think I was 19 years old or something like that. But yeah, I mean, I would have started there. That's that's what I would have done, and how I would have built that out. I hope that I hope that answers your question, um, because that's something that you know, if I would have started, it would have resulted in something good. All right, all right, good. That's everything I wanted to talk to you about tonight. I hope you found it helpful. I hope you understood how brands create demand, where that comes from, what you could do with your business to actually create that experience and that viewpoint. I really appreciate you guys being here. The replay will be up on YouTube after. I'll see you next Wednesday at seven o'clock at Cislo Spice. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great evening.